Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Years ago, while I was a student matriculating at the Interdenominational Theological Center, my preaching professor, the Reverend Dr. Wallace Hartsfield III, said one of those statements that sounds really good and sensational in the moment, but don't make immediate sense. We were in the middle of our preaching practicum, and one of my classmates had just finished their sermon on Ecclesiastes 3, that oft-repeated familiar portion of scripture that begins... For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. Reviewing my classmate's sermon, Dr. Hartsfield stated that they had conveniently skipped over the harder parts of that passage and might do well to reflect more on the difficult lines that we see in that scripture. For example, he said, there is a time for everything, a time to love and a time to hate. When it is time to hate, Perhaps we ought not spend time trying to love. Now, I remember being shocked to hear a Christian pastor, a child of the civil rights movement in Kansas City, Missouri, and a practitioner of nonviolent direct action utter that phrase. And to be honest, as a seminarian, I was also drawn to the scandalous, scintillating spiritual sound bites just like that because they broke through the religious nonsense. Dr. Hartsfield's statement resonated with me because it was a critique of a church culture that often engages in spiritual bypassing, which, according to John Wellwood, is the tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, and unfinished developmental tasks. I had grown up in an ecclesial culture that was almost addicted to this kind of saccharine spirituality, so much so that it ill-equipped us to wrestle with deep questions and hard in hard spaces. The third chapter of Ecclesiastes, particularly as Dr. Hartsfield had interpreted it in that moment, seemed to me to be an invitation to a grittier spirituality one that honors the reality of the human experience and refuses to be satisfied by easy answers and half-truths. For everything there is a season, sacred scripture reads, and a time for every matter under heaven. The Hebrew Bible reading for the third Sunday after the Epiphany is from the book of Jonah. Now, the book of Jonah begins with God telling Jonah, the prophet, to go to Nineveh and to call the city to repentance. Now, if you're familiar with the story, then you know that Jonah gets up and then proceeds to do the literal opposite of what God asked him to do. He, he attempts to run from God's call by charting a course to the other side of the known world. After a life-threatening storm and spending three days in the belly of a conveniently placed great fish, Jonah has a change of heart. He relents and finally heeds the command of God. And that's where our scripture picks up the story. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out to it the call that I speak to you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was a great city of gods, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to come into the city one day's walk, and he called out and said, Forty days more, and Nineveh is overthrown. And the people of Nineveh trusted God, and they called a fast, and donned sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. And God saw their acts, that they had turned back from their evil way. And God relented from the evil that he said to do to them, and he did not do it. That's where our scripture ends. 
with God extending mercy to a city that scripture says belongs to God, but was outside of Jonah's understanding of God's mercy. And I think that that cutoff right at verse five is rather unfortunate because the next verse is where the story gets scandalous. Jonah four and one says, and the thing God's mercy shown to the Ninevites was very evil for Jonah and he was incensed. Translation, Jonah was mad because in that moment, he discovered that God's mercy does not merely extend only to those of whom Jonah approves. Jonah has a very specific interpretation of God. Prior to this moment, it would have never occurred to Jonah that God was not merely God of Jerusalem. This moment is the moment Jonah learns that God is God of Jerusalem and Tarshish and Nineveh and every place else. The psalmist reminds us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God's mercy extends to everyone, even the people we have every reason and right to despise. Cutting off that passage at the end of chapter three can make us think that the point of the book of Jonah is the conversion of Nineveh. The broader story, however, tells a different tale. Jonah is about how God's mercy challenges us to be people who hold space for reconciliation even while we work out our own stuff. Jonah is about the conversion necessary to be about God's mission in a fractured time. Now, God knows that Jonah and the rest of Israel had every reason to despise Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Assyria had invaded the northern kingdom and and nearly succeeded in invading the southern kingdom. The book of the prophet Nahum is a judgment against the brutality of Nineveh, calling it a city of bloodshed. However Jonah felt, Jonah had every right and reason to feel the way that he did. But however Jonah felt about Nineveh, God still laid claim to it. God still considered it beloved and God was still concerned about it. Jonah learned this. Jonah knew this. Jonah fled from his call by God because in his own words, he knew that God was a God who was gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abundant in kindness and relenting from evil. And he did not want to share this message, this good news with those he didn't think deserved to hear it. The book of Jonah ends with God asking Jonah a question. Shall I not also have pity for Nineveh, that great city? We followers of God revealed by Jesus Christ, son of our sister Mary, must hold two truths during this season of reckoning with racial injustice. We, like Jonah, are called to proclaim by word and example God's reconciling love to the world. And we, like Jonah, have to deal with our own stuff. Where Jonah went wrong isn't with his anger or his feelings towards Nineveh. Jonah went wrong when God called him to process his stuff and to step into compassion, and he was either unwilling or unable to do so. We, like Jonah, must realize that God has claim on us and on the people we despise the most. That reality should be challenging because the invitation to transformation is not simply an invitation to those we see as our enemies. Friends, we must all be changed and transformed if we are to inherit the world promised to us in Scripture. The prayer for our enemies from the Book of Common Prayer reads thusly, O God, the Father of all whose Son commanded us to love our enemies, lead them and us from prejudice to truth. Deliver them and us from hatred, cruelty, and revenge. And in your good time, 
Enable us all to stand reconciled before you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's challenge to Jonah remains our challenge in this moment. We are called to a radically prophetic moral imagination that doesn't merely see a world where those who have been on the bottom now rise to the top. No, ours is not simply to hope for a better world. Ours is a hope for a world that is new. We are called to imagine a radically new world where former grievances, no matter how legitimate, no longer hold relationships hostage and instead give way to God's compassionate and reconciling love. Now, this requires a radically different way of relating across difference, across grievance, and across pain. It requires truth-telling, honesty, and reconciliation in order for us to build and inherit this new world. Adrian Marie Brown asks, when we imagine the world we want to shift towards, are we dreaming of being the winners in the future? Or are we dreaming of a world where winning is no longer necessary? because there are no enemies. If the book of Jonah is any indication, God imagines a future, friends, where there are no enemies. I'm not going to pretend as if this is easy work. If it were easy, it sure would have been done by now. I do know that this work is necessary work, and it is work I feel called to embody in this moment. Our work in this moment is the proclamation of the loving reality of God and the sorting through of our own stuff. For everything, there is a season indeed. When we are hurt or traumatized by white supremacist violence, racist microaggressions, anti-black bias, dehumanizing institutional, systemic, and public policy, and systems reflecting a white supremacist culture, it is natural to experience hate as a defense mechanism. That sensation and emotion has something to teach us if we let it, but friends, we cannot stay there. We must constantly place our emotions under the discipline and the rule of Christ, process our stuff in a healthy and realistic way, and endeavor to be about God's business. For everything, there is a season. But one glad morning, the long winter of sin will give way to the bright spring of reconciliation. That day, the sun will rise in the morning and it will never set again. Our work is to prepare our hearts to inherit the world on that great and glorious day when all God's children will gather in that great camp meeting in the promised land. In that season, there will be no more need for hate because we will have learned how to be siblings, family, and kindred in the kingdom of our God.